Uh, we're very pleased to have now on with us Katerina Zelenko, the Ukraine ambassador to Singapore. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, good morning. We, we've had you on before and we've enjoyed our conversations with you so much. We wanted to make sure we get you on again to find out what the latest is in your homeland. How are you doing and how's everybody doing at home? Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I'm in constant contact with uh, friends, with my family, with my parents in Ukraine. The situation remains very tense. My parents, uh, they live in the central part of Ukraine and they usually spend their nights in the basement because of the silence. Yeah. And during the day, they try to perform the daily activities to volunteer, to support territorial defense units, as everyone does. The country is really united in its bid to um, defend the country, to defend the nation from the military aggression of the Russian Federation. And Ambassador, we're, they're still trying to keep these humanitarian corridors open. The latest I read is that Ukraine and Russia had approved an evacuation for the besieged port city of Mariupol, but they're still having problems evacuating citizens of Mariupol out through the humanitarian corridors. I mean, how frustrated are you? And, and just what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, in fact, this is heartbreaking to see that there are still around 160,000 people in Mariupol who cannot leave the city. Um, and um, all the arranged corridors could only work out partially, only part of people could really leave the, the uh, city. So the problem is still there. Of course, this is all a matter of trust, which we uh, do not have if we speak about the arrangements made with the Russian Federation, because we also had the same situation with the previous talks on the humanitarian corridors uh, near the uh, town of Irpin in the Kiev region. It was actually the same. Um, well, we remain in talks because actually the utmost priority is saving lives and uh, um, giving support to those who are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. You're absolutely right, and I think you uh, could uh, uh, highlight this in the talk with Stefan Daimaya, that um, 12 million people in Ukraine are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance, and we have unfortunately um, already uh, reached the mark of 4 million in terms of moving out of Ukraine to the neighboring countries, which um, are also already stretched to the limits in accommodating refugees of Ukraine. The fact is that the, the best and the soonest and the sweetest way to um, uh, solve, to resolve the humanitarian crisis is to stop the war. Yeah. Uh, uh most definitely. Uh, is it your understanding? We asked this question to Stefan, and, and he didn't he didn't really know because they're not involved. But from what you've heard about the negotiations, the ongoing negotiations, how how central are the humanitarian concerns to those negotiations? I, I know there are a lot of issues on the table that are massive between the two countries. Are are the are the refugees are the people uh, the non combatants being talked about in those? From what you're able to gather. Yeah, I think if we speak about the negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, we speak also about the negotiations of two different approaches towards the humanitarian issues and approaches to the people. For Ukraine, it is uh, uh, crucial and critical to save lives. For the Russian leadership, it seems to be different, as we see that 17,000 of Russian soldiers have already died in Ukraine. And uh, as we see that Russian army is being... Um, regrouped and uh, replenished, it means that maybe new ones will also come, which means that uh, the de-escalation is not in sight. Speaking uh, about the negotiations, yes, every war inev inevitably ends with the negotiations and with the agreement. However, uh, there is still a long way to go. We see that mm -hmm. there is some, uh, some slight progress uh, towards moving to um, further points of uh, these talks, but we still see that um, it is far too early to speak about the robust progress in this peaceful um, talks. Yeah. Yes, the, uh, the the invasion continues, so it's, it's incumbent upon the international community to do all it can, and I'm reading that the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said that Australia will send armoured Bushmaster vehicles to Ukraine. How is it important that leaders, the international community, 
like the Australian Prime Minister, do what they can to assist Ukraine? I think this is critical, especially now as we see that Russian army could not achieve its ultimate objectives on the ground. Um, it means that maybe we will face further waves of escalation and further attacks from the air, which is still the most fragile part of our defense. And Ukraine urgently needs support from our partners, extended deliveries of uh, weapons of advanced air defense systems, which could help us save lives and uh, um, try to hold our ground. We are very grateful to our partners for delivering these weapons. There is a popular joke in Ukraine, though, that the biggest supplier of weapons to Ukraine is now the Russian Federation, due to the <laughs> number of tanks and equipment captured by our guys in the battlefield. But it is also a testament to the sad truth that actually we mm. haven't got um, enough uh, weapons in sufficient um, um, quality and quantity. It means that much more needs to be done. We are still dealing with a very formidable enemy. So it means that uh, if we do not get the tools, it will be really hard to make a difference. I always recall this historical um, uh, quote of Winston Churchill, 1941, as in his radio address, as he said, uh, give us tools and we will finish the job. I can all repeat it. Just give us tools and we will finish the job. No. Yeah. We're talking with uh, Katerina Zelenko, the Ukrainian ambassador to Singapore. Uh, there was a daring attack on uh, this fuel depot inside of Russia yesterday. Uh, it was in the, uh, the city of Belgorod, which is just 40 kilometers over the border. Now, so far, your government is denying responsibility or, or in the case of your president, saying they will neither confirm nor deny. Uh, do you have anything new that you can report on that as to, in terms of who was responsible for that, uh, for that attack? Yes, I see the same picture. I also see that also from Russian and there was not really, there was no official uh, blame in Ukraine of that. So we can really do not see any official um, statements which would either confirm it or deny. But I think we always need to keep in mind uh, also the 51st article of the UN Charter, where the good right of every nation for defense or self-defense, individual and collective defense is enshrined. And I think that every country needs to take care of its own security and safety of its territory and of its critical infrastructure. Because if we speak about the critical infrastructure in Ukraine, it was one of the main targets of the Russian Federation. Oil depots, gas pipelines, uh, airports, uh, bridges. So these were the main targets which have been destroyed by the Russian Federation. Yeah, uh, of course, look, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily make you uh, expect you to make an announcement, but, um, uh, you know, from from a perspective of somebody watching the news, it would seem logical that Ukraine uh, was responsible for that. But on the ground, it must be giving some comfort or uh, joy to Ukrainians to see that a fuel depot that was probably supplying uh, fuel to the the weapons of war that are in Ukraine was taken out. Are you hearing anything from friends back home about that? Are they are they celebrating? No matter who was responsible for it. You know they are too busy with uh, with other problems and with other challenges right now. Uh, what I can definitely say is that our army is highly motivated. They are really uh, committed and determined to defend the country because it is much more than just about our territorial integrity. And it is also much more than about Ukraine. And it's very important that more and more countries have this clear-eyed um, view of what is really at stake now, if we speak about this terrible war. Yeah. I mean, Ambassador, you mentioned that defiance there. It still staggers me when I see the, the Klitschko brothers, among others, standing in you know war-torn parts of their, their cities and, and defiant and and mayors and governors speaking out, refusing to, to surrender or refusing to hide away. However, what we are seeing, which we feared, is that it's taking up gradually less and less of the daily news cycle as the world starts to move on a little bit. This was always going to be the fear in the 24-hour news cycle. I think this week Hollywood has had just as many headlines as uh, Ukraine for what happened at the Oscars. So is that a concern for you, Ambassador, that Ukraine must remain front and center 
of the international news cycle. Yes, definitely. It is sad that uh, sometimes you see that there is a bit less, okay, still a lot, as you say, but a bit less interest to what um, this topic. I think we need to keep it uh, in the focus because we already see that what is happening in Ukraine has impact and has implications on all corners of the world. We know that Ukraine is one of the major suppliers of essential food products globally. Mm. Every tenth loaf of bread is made of Ukrainian wheat. Uh, and Ukraine is one of the major suppliers for the countries in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia. It has already led to the soaring prices for food. It will inevitably have um, um, the result uh, of rising prices for energy. And this is just the beginning. But still, we need to um, uh, keep uh, moving forward on the path of sanctions, of putting further restrictions on the Russian Federation. The main thing is not to um, hurt Russian people. I think uh, the one who has hurt them the most is their own uh, leadership and the Putin's regime. It's just a matter of time. But all the sanctions, uh, the ultimate goal is just to deprive uh, Russian leadership of uh, revenues which allow him, allow them to uh, fund this dangerous military machine. If you look at the um, structure of the Russian budget, one third of it is uh, consists of military expenses. Do you know well, just to follow up uh, briefly on the ambassador? Do you think the international sanctions are finally taking hold on Russia? You know, the sanctions always work like a snowball. Yeah, so they are the. It's going to be more and more painful in a month or two. And if we um, do that systematically, then it will also have effect anyway. You see that it's getting more and more a political hot potato to deal with Russia, to do business with Russia, to uh, strike deals. Uh, more than 400 companies, international companies, have already left the Russian market. And um, I think this process is ongoing, and this is important and crucial, not only in terms of the uh, solidarity of the world, I think, is also one of the elements which uh, Putin underestimated. But also in terms of uh, not allowing the Kremlin to finance the war. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Zelenko, there have, uh, there have been a lot of stories uh, around the uh, attempted assassination plots against President Zelensky in the past five weeks. Just yesterday, he was on a video call and announced that he was firing two of his senior members of his National Security Service on the grounds that they were traitors. Uh, are, are there some cracks happening within, you know, inside the, his administration, uh, you know, under the, the fog and the strain of war that should be concerning to, to those who are in support of Ukraine? I'm sure that it will not have um, um, big implications on the functioning of the um, of the whole team around um, of the government uh, dealing with taking the necessary decisions in order to tackle this um, crisis. Definitely not. Actually, the whole government, all the institutions, uh, civil society, uh, is really functioning as a well-oiled machine now. There is a system, there is a need. We are all united around one ultimate goal, to defend our country and to stop this war. It's, it might sound maybe warmongering, but actually Ukraine is a very peaceful nation, which has never invaded any, any, sovereign, any other sovereign country. But now we are on our soil, we are on our territory, and it's about us to make a difference. Yeah. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today. We do have to leave it there for now. I'm, as always, hoping you'll come on in the future. Uh, Katerina Zelenko, the Ukrainian ambassador to Singapore, much appreciate your time today. My pleasure.